All right, I introduce Dr. Kelly Moore. Thanks, Vanessa. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get this presentation going. Okay. All right. Does that look good? Can everyone see that? Thumbs up, Vanessa. I had trouble with this last time, so I just want to make sure everyone can see it. Let me know. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, so navigating menopause. This is a topic I'm super passionate about because we don't talk about it enough. And so um, I like getting this information out to women really just so um, you are armed with the information you need to understand what is a normal process in your body and, um, and can be an uncomfortable process. And it's less uncomfortable when you understand what's happening and you know your options. So excited to share this information with you all. Let's see, how do I, there we go. Before we get started, I just want to lay some groundwork when we talk about lifestyle medicine, which is um, the type of medicine I like to practice. Um, there's a lot of information about lifestyle modifications, and I really provide this information for education, inspiration, empowerment, not so that you feel guilty about things you're not doing or feel overwhelmed by things you should do. Um, so please um, keep that in mind uh, as we move through this information. Um, also, it's important to note that this is for educational purposes only. And really, if you're struggling with um, symptoms of perimenopause or concerned about mitigating health risks postmenopause, it's a really good idea to talk with a, a, a healthcare provider. Um, all right. I am a naturopathic physician. I see patients by telehealth through Ripple Wellness in Washougal, so I can see patients anywhere in Washington State. And my focus is really on preventing and treating chronic disease, including digestive, hormonal, metabolic disorders, and using lifestyle medicine as my foundation with the assistance of nutraceuticals, sometimes with hormones, as we'll talk about today, sometimes with medication. Um, a little bit of information about Ripple for those of you who aren't familiar with our clinic. It is located in Washougal, and it's a really cool multidisciplinary clinic. We've got two naturopaths and several acupuncturists, massage therapists, a nutrition um, counselor, mental health counselor, and we even have an expert in yoga and breath work. So really great team. And we also do regular community classes. So, um, and also send out regular newsletters. So if you're interested in staying in the loop, just put your email in the chat and we'll keep you posted on everything. All right. So outline for today's talk, we're going to just start by understanding menopause and then um, talk about lifestyle optimization for smoothing that menopausal transition. Um, and then we'll talk about additional options for symptom support. And then we'll also touch on what comes after menopause um, in terms of our health and some opportunities to dive a little bit deeper. So let's just start with understanding. And really, um, that kind of starts with understanding all of our misconceptions throughout history, starting way back in Hippocrates' time, the father of medicine. Um, in the early, uh, in the 400s BC, um, he referred to menopause as a climacteric syndrome, kind of like when women reached their maximal um, potential and, and began to lose power and were not much loose use to society. So that was kind of the framework that they were looking at menopause at that time and that culture, which really influenced our culture and our medicine. Um, it wasn't recognized as a medical condition until the 1880s, and it was described in really sad terms as the death of the womb. And even menopause, which essentially means the stopping of the of menstruation, you know, it sounds if you just kind of say menopause, it doesn't sound that offensive. There's not much attachment to it. But if you think about labeling the phases of a woman's life by what her uterus is doing, then that starts to become a little bit more like, huh, why do we, why do we do that? Why do we focus on, you know, we don't label men, the phases of men's life as like pre-erectile and erectile and post-erectile. So um, whenever you wonder if something is, has a little twinge of uh, misogyny, then just ask yourself what it would be like if we did the same for men. And then you can kind of get a little bit of, of perspective on that. So the, the language around menopause is really important because 
it not only impacts um, how we learn about menopause, but it can even impact how we experience menopause. So it is important. Um, Freud argued that menopause was a neurosis caused by lack of hormones. And in the 60s, we had a prominent male gynecologist and an author who did start to promote um, hormone therapy for women, um, really in the context, though, of how it would benefit men. He says, every woman has the right, indeed the duty, to counteract the chemical castration of menopause so that and this is my screen's not, there's a little bar on the bottom of my screen, but basically so that they can continue to be um, more enjoyable um, around men. So that was, you know, that was in the 60s. And then we had um, really kind of the heyday of, of hormone therapy up until the early 2000s when we started to learn that there could be potentially some health risks associated with hormone therapy. And we'll talk about um, kind of where we're at today at the end of our conversation. But um, really, men, women have been culturally uh, in our culture have been underserved in terms of menopause, and it's getting better. But it still persists when women will be really early in perimenopause and misdiagnosed or dismissed by their physician or prescribed an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication when really what they're experiencing are really um, profound changes in hormones that have um, impacts throughout their body that you learn about today. Um, this isn't surprising when you know that um, we spend probably on average an hour or less learning about menopause specifically in medical school. Um, and then you think about, you know, the ages that people are going through medical school, school average ages, you know, late 20s, 30s, menopause is not something that um, is of great interest to people in that population. And so it's understanding that, you know, and uh, there's not a lot of, of real deep understanding when you just go to a, a general practitioner who hasn't taken a deeper dive in their education. And providers can be uncomfortable talking about perimenopausal symptoms, things like vaginal dryness and low libido and things like that can be uncomfortable sometimes for patients and providers. And then menopausal symptoms um, are sometimes considered less important and they're also less lucrative than other gynecological conditions. So there's kind of less incentive to, to really study them. Um, and then there's just this cultural expectation that women um, are just gonna suffer. We suffer through our periods, we suffer through childbirth and we're gonna suffer through menopause. It's just kind of part of part of our lot in life. And that I will, that's one of my biggest takeaway messages is that you don't have to suffer through menopause. We've got lots of options to help support. What is at the end of the day, a completely natural process. And that's another one of my takeaways today. I just want to normalize menopause, just like we normalize um, puberty. In fact, sometimes we think about menopause as a reverse puberty. It's just a really profound and important change in hormones. That's totally natural. Um, and, and so just like puberty, it's, it's just a phase of our, of our lives. And in fact, we spend a about 40% of our life after menopause, if we live to kind of the average age in this country. Um, and so that's a long time that we're postmenopausal. Um, and it's important to understand the implications of that. Um, menopause, menopause itself, and we'll talk more about exactly what that is. It's a really important time to be paying attention to your body. It's a kind of a window for health, a time when your physiology is changing a lot. And what that means is that minor health issues like insulin sensitivity or a propensity to autoimmunity could amplify and turn into a full-blown condition. But conversely, when you make small lifestyle changes during this phase, you really set yourself up, set yourself up for a smooth transition and then um, better health after menopause. So it's a time that it pays, pays to make uh, lifestyle changes. So what exactly is, what do we, mean when we're talking about menopause. Well, menopause itself is, is really just like a line in the sand. And I'll show you a, a chart in just a minute so you can visualize that. But it marks 12 months from your last menstrual period. And we're gonna, we call that the final menstrual period. So if you go eight months and then you have another period, then you start counting over. So 12 months from your final menstrual period, that is when um, you're technically, you cross that line and you become postmenopausal. Um, it usually occurs before age 45, um, excuse me, after age 45 and before age 40, 54. The average age in this country is 51 to 52. It's not affected by when you started your period, interestingly, that your age of men are. 
Um, and so there's a couple of distinctions I want to make when we talk about menopause. You can have natural menopause. This is this just means isn't, there's no good or bad attached to any of these labels, but a natural menopause is caused by loss of the activity of the ovaries, usually due to aging, but not always. We can have premature ovarian insufficiency, when, which is essentially really early menopause. And that is the same, you know, that's a natural uh, menopause, but that doesn't mean it's healthy. And, and um, we can talk more about that in a minute. In a minute. Then there's induced menopause is most common with a full hysterectomy or with cancer treatments that affect the ovaries and, and stop their functioning. Um, okay, timing matters with menopause. Um, there's kind of a Goldilocks zone for, um, for our hormones. We're going to be talking about two main hormones today, estrogen and progesterone, and we have receptors for those hormones all throughout our body. And they do a lot. And we'll see, see that throughout the presentation. And there's a kind of an optimal amount of time you want your body to be exposed to estrogen in particular to help protect bones and brain and, and heart. Um, and then too little or too much can have um, negative um, health impacts. So if you have premature menopause or um, primary ovarian insufficiency, your final menstru menstrual period happens before age 40. That's something to definitely investigate with um, a provider that can be caused by an autoimmune condition, or sometimes we don't know what causes it, but you definitely want to um, get um, care and typically it's recommended that you do menopause, that you do hormone replacement therapy so that you can continue to be exposed to estrogen for some more time, more years. And then early menopause is when your final menstrual period occurs after age 40, but before age 45. And this does also put you at risk for osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease and dementia, all of which are associated with insufficient um, estrogen exposure over a lifespan. And so um, oftentimes when this happens, it's also recommended to put women on um, uh, menopausal hormone therapy. Um, then we have the, you know, the sort of normal age of menopause before age 45 and 54. If we have menopause after age 55, then it is associated with an increased risk for too much estrogen exposure. And that um, can um, be a risk factor for breast and endometrial cancer. So more, more uh, prefixes uh, to menopause. Um, Premenopause, when you hear that, that just means your reproductive years from puberty or from menar to perimenopause. So those are these are times uh, a time when um, hormone cycling is, is fairly regular um, in healthy women. And then perimenopause, and I'm gonna show you a, a graph of what this looks like, but this is a process that starts out, can start out really subtle. It's a process of hormonal change that occurs in a sequence of events, which I'll talk about in just a minute, that can take place two to 10 years before menopause. So if you think the average age of menopause is 50, to, um, you know, women as young as 42 or even in their late 30s can start to experience really subtle symptoms, sometimes not always subtle, symptoms of lower progesterone in particular. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a minute. Um, and then post-menopause, remember menopause is that line in the sand 12 months from your last menstrual period. And then post-menopause is from that line for the rest of your life, you're post-menopausal. Um, Okay, the sequence of events tonight we're going to talk about in more detail, specifically perimenopause, because this is a, a potentially quite a long period of time where hormones change quite a bit, and there can be a lot of associated symptoms that aren't always um, recognized right away. And so it's helpful for you to understand this and know this about your own body and know that you know kind of know why why you might be feeling the way you are. So the sequence of events happens in this order, typically. You're gonna start with lower progesterone levels. So the two hormones, like I said, we're talking about are both made in the ovaries. Um, you have progesterone and then you have estrogen and then you have progesterone, but you have to ovulate to make progesterone. Um, you don't have to ovulate to make estrogen. And as we get older, we start to skip ovulatory cycles. We might not ovulate every cycle. We still could menstruate, but not have actually ovulated. And then there are other 
factors that like stress and um, nutrition that can all cause the ovaries to make less progesterone. So for mul multiple reasons, that's the hormone that starts to bottom out first is progesterone. And I'll show you what that kind of looks like in terms of symptoms in just a minute, but that can happen in late thirties. And certainly by early forties, you can be experiencing that while estrogen is normal, right? But but when estrogen is normal and progesterone is low, you're still going to feel like estrogen is high. That's called estrogen dominance. And I'll, sh I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute as well. Then progesterone is still low and estrogen starts to kind of go crazy. This is like um, basically like the communication line between your brain and your ovary is getting a little bit run down. And so the brain is sometimes shouting at the ovaries and sometimes it's not saying anything. And sometimes the ovaries are responding appropriately and sometimes it's overreacting. So you can get these, like you can get higher estrogen than you've ever had in your life in your late forties. And that's where you get that really heavy bleeding. Um, but it can be really high and then crash down. And then, so it's, it's a real roller coaster in, um, in that phase of perimenopause. And then it bottoms out too. So then you have low progesterone and low estrogen and the associated symptoms. But um, it's important to know all, you know, all three of these things will happen. It's not just low estrogen, right? We typically think about menopause as low as a state of low estrogen. And yes, being postmenopausal is a state of low estrogen and progesterone, but being perimenopausal, you know, you could have high estrogen. So what does this look like? Um, the red is the estradiol, which is the form of estrogen I'm talking about that's made in the ovaries. And then we have progesterone. And so you can see um, we're not making much in early childhood. The ovaries start to get a little bit active, you know, pre-puberty, and then they start to make estrogen. And finally, progesterone. So you have some irregular cycles here in early puberty, and then kind of get to a phase in your reproductive years where estrogen and progesterone are pretty consistent every cycle. And then as you get into perimenopause, um, you know, this graph is, is trying to depict, you know, maybe one cycle you have low progesterone and maybe relatively normal estrogen. And then maybe you have Mid, like a, a, a middle amount of progesterone and really high estrogen. And then maybe you have low, you know, low progesterone and high estrogen. And so you have this, all these different possible combinations are going to make you feel different. And then finally you have low estrogen. Um, and so um, what does this look like kind of on this timeline? Well, let's look here at this line here. This is the final menstrual period. You don't know when that happens in the moment. You don't know when your last period is actually your last period. You only know that 12 months later. Okay, but but there's your final menstrual, menstrual period. And we can divide the time around that into four phases of, um, of perimenopause. We have very early perimenopause, early menopause transition, late menopause transition, and late perimenopause. So let me talk you through what each of those are going to look like. In the, your very early perimenopause, this can be two to five years before that final menstrual period. You might have um, regular periods, but you might have subtle signs of changes like more tender breasts, acne, clotting, more cramping, less cramping, lighter periods. Um, uh, so your periods are still coming every um you know, 26 to 35 days or so. And they're not varying. They might vary a little in terms of maybe one month is 28 days and one month it's 30, but they're not varying by a lot. So that's very early perimenopause. And then they do start to vary more. You might have, you know, a cycle that's 36 days and then a cycle that's um closer to 20 tw uh to 25. So um and they're going to have more associated symptoms. And that's going to be a sign that you're in that early menopausal transition phase. Again, that could be up to three years before your final menstrual period. And then you're going to have 60 days without a flow. You're going to have actually skipped a whole cycle. And that's um, that doesn't mean you're going to have your final menstrual period anytime soon, but it does mean that potentially you're, with, you're in within three years of having that final menstrual period, you're in late um, uh, the late menopause transition. And then you have your final menstrual period, but you don't know that. So, you know, for the next 12 months, you're in what's called late perimenopause, and then you become postmenopausal. So 
um, I think this is really helpful to kind of, you know, you can think about, you know, what's going on in your body and where you might be. And then you can think back to um, this graph and, and kind of visualize what, what might be happening with your hormones. If you're in that very early perimenopause, um, you might just have, you know, the progesterone might just be down here. It's a little bit lower or maybe even down here and estrogen is normal. Um, and then as you get into um, sort of that late um, perimenopause, you start, start skipping cycles or late menopausal transition, you start skipping cycles. Maybe some cycles are heavier and that's because of this you know, high estrogen in the context of the low progesterone, you're gonna have heavy bleeding. And then when you start to you know, really um, skip multiple cycles in a row and um, start to experience hot flashes, vaginal dryness, those are all signs of low estrogen. Okay, let's talk about what these hormones do so you can kind of understand why they cause the symptoms that they cause when they're low or high. You can think of progesterone as a calming and sustaining hormone. It helps to balance out the effects of estrogen. And it also helps to, um, the reason it has its name, progestational. It's progestational. You have to have it in order to sustain a pregnancy. It's made by the ovaries after you ovulate um, in the anticipation of a potential pregnancy. Um, so it helps to support the uterine lining and hold it in place. Um, I said that starts to decline in your mid thirties. Um, estrogen, you can think of it as um, kind of voluptuous and juicy. It, it creates um, vaginal secretion. It helps our skin stay moist. It um, causes you know female sex characteristics, and then it also is a building hormone. It loves to like it triggers the, the tissue growth in the body, so breast and in the uterus, but potentially in other places. Um, it's produced primarily in our ovaries, but also in our adrenal glands, which are a little gland above our kidneys and in our fat. And that's one of the reasons fat becomes more stubborn when our ovaries stop making as much estrogen because our body's trying to get estrogen from other tissues. Production becomes less consistent when we're in our forties. So what does it feel like to have low progesterone? Well, it can be hard to sleep. You can have hot flashes and night sweats just with low um, progesterone. It can cause mood disturbances, particularly anxiety, but also depression and struggles with memory. And it can cause heart palpitations and, I think that, oh, and headaches, migraines. And then when you have low progesterone, even in the context of normal estrogen, it, you don't have enough to balance out that proliferative effect of estrogen. So you're going to have heavier and more painful periods. So if you look at some of these, you know, and you start to think about, you know, how women start to feel differently in their late thirties, early forties. Um, and sometimes, um, those symptoms can be misattributed to other things. And sometimes they are, you know, anxiety, they would benefit from an anxiolytic medication. Um, so there's lots of reasons for struggling for insomnia, but it's uh, struggling from insomnia, but it's important to remember that low progesterone is one of those reasons. Um, Okay, estrogen has a lot of roles in the body. Development of female sex characteristics, it thickens the uterine lining in preparation for a pregnancy. It helps with vaginal lubrication. Um, it also promotes muscle growth and preserves bone density. So it's really important for our musculoskeletal system. Um, it helps to maintain urinary continence. We have estrogen receptors in our urinary tract, helps maintain skin elasticity and stimulate hair growth helps us to sustain normal body temperature, helps us to stay insulin sensitive, which is really important. And one of the consequences of low estrogen that can lead to greater cardiovascular risk postmenopausally is we become less insulin sensitive. That affects our cholesterol balances. Um, and um, estrogen also helps balance out our stress hormone cortisol. It helps control blood pressure, regulate the appetite, it even affects neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and um, it's neuroprotective because it supports circulation in the brain. So these are a lot of really important things and this starts to explain, you know, why there's that window, that Goldilocks zone of um, amount of time you want your body, your tissues to be exposed to estrogen. It's important. So um, when you have high and fluctuating estrogen, 
these are some symptoms you might feel. So heavy and painful periods, irritability, breast pain, even things like high histamine, estrogen, estrogen will trigger histamine, which can cause um, like allergic symptoms like hives, nasal congestion, ringing in the ear, diarrhea, nausea, low blood pressure. So um, yeah, lots of, lots of things that don't feel good, um, can be associated with that part of perimenopause where estrogen is high. And then it bottoms out. And that's when we definitely start to feel hot flashes and night sweats, mood and sleep disturbance, the thinning of the vaginal and urethral tissue, um, vaginal dryness, itching, pain, increased urinary frequency, incontinence, prolapse, where you start to get organs kind of falling into the uterus, like, um, the, uh, like the bladder and the rectum, um, urinary tract infections. And this is kind of co to collectively is are called, um, genitourinary symptoms of menopause. And this is important to pay attention to not so much in, um, the early, um, you know, in perimenopause or even early postmenopause, but as you get progressively older and especially into your seventies, eighties, nineties, this becomes a, a really, um, potentially dangerous issue because urinary tract infections can be almost asymptomatic in older women. Um, uh, and they can, the first symptom can um, often be um, confusion or even delirium. And so um, we'll talk more about that later, but don't, don't ignore and don't let your doctor ignore There's There's um, ways to treat this. Um, vaginal dryness isn't just something to kind of brush off body aches and pains. And then of course, changes in body composition, because we don't have the estrogen to support, um, muscle growth as easily. And, um, we can gain weight in the abdomen become more, even more insulin sensitive. Um, we start to lose that lean muscle mass and also bone density. So, um, yeah, it's something to, that we really want to be cognizant of, and we have tools for, for countering, but we need to be proactive about that. Oh, other changes doesn't stop here. Ladies, we've got thinning of the skin, dry, drying of the skin, wrinkles, acne, um, thinning of the hair on your head. And then here's where you don't want it. Rogue hairs, estrogen, low estrogen can even affect our teeth and, um, cause gum loss. It affects our vision, affects our hearing our cognition. So there's really not a system in the body that isn't affected by this change in estrogen. And that doesn't mean that it's pathologic. It doesn't mean that our body doesn't recalibrate to a low estrogen state and work just fine, but it is going to be, um, it is going to be a transition. And that's something that you can really be proactive about supporting. So how do you know if you are, um, in menopause, if you're in perimenopause, if you're postmenopausal, especially if you don't have a uterus, right? If you're no longer menstruating, but you still have your ovaries. So there's no one test that can diagnose menopause. And that's because, um, you know, you could measure your hormones and they could be low. And we saw, well, that might just be one cycle and the next cycle, they could be high again. So it's, it is a little bit tricky to, um, to diagnose in blood work. You can run something called an FSH, which, um, is a hormone that comes from the brain and talks to the ovaries. Um, and if that is out of range, um, it's elevated, it gives you a clue that you're, you could be within three years of your final menstrual period. Um, it doesn't mean that looking at blood work isn't helpful. Um, you can look at estrogen and progesterone in the blood work um, to confirm suspected estrogen dominance if you um, are younger and would be expected to have normal levels of progesterone. Um, but you're feeling symptoms of low progesterone, then you can you can try to look at that in the blood. It's it's a little bit more complicated, but um, it can be a good place to start. Um, you can also look at estrogen metabolites, what our, what our liver does to estrogen before it excretes it. You can look at that in the liver and the urine, and that can help you understand how your body is clearing estrogen. There's different ways that it, different pathways it can send estrogen down. And some of them are more proliferative, um, and can, um, be associated with breast cancer. Some of them are, um, even more carcinogenic. Um, so that can be helpful to look at, but really one of the best ways and where I often encourage women to start is just symptothermic tracking. And that's essentially just tracking your basal body temperature, your temperature first thing in the morning before you start moving around and your cervical fluid. Um, both of those, um, signs 
are really helpful when you track them and, and can tell you a lot about what's going on in your body. Um, okay, so we talked about, you know, we described in great detail the potential roller coaster of perimenopause, and there's a lot that can happen, and you can kind of understand how women feel um, for a few years, like everything's falling apart. But um, don't lose hope. There is a lot that you can do to set yourself up for a smoother transition um, through perimenopause and for better health postmenopausally um, through lifestyle. Lifestyle makes a big difference. And so there's different ways we can think about um, lifestyle. And um, on this first slide, I, I've um, highlighted ways you can eat for ovarian health. Remember, these hormones are made in our ovaries. And the healthier our ovaries are, the longer and the better quality of, of hormone they're going to be able to make. Um, our, our ovaries are very sensitive to oxidative stress, which affects the little um, uh, powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria, and basically diminish the ovarian reserve, diminish how long our ovaries can can pump out eggs for. So oxidative stress can come from internal biochemical processes. If we don't have enough antioxidants to um, counter that, it can also come from external, uh, um, you know, sources of oxidation like pollution. So, you know, the mess that the kind of takeaway there is to minimize your oxidative stress. That's not already just happening in your body, minimize your external sources of toxins, and then give your body the nutrients that it needs to combat, um, the rest of the oxidative stress. And so that's really going to be, um, plentiful phytonutrients. So lots of different colors of fruits and veggies. That's a great way to get those um, antioxidants in and then avoiding inflammatory foods like highly processed foods, um, which includes most seed oils. So like soy and corn and safflower, those are all more inflammatory oils. Added sugar in any form is, is inflammatory and then alcohol. Those are some low hanging fruits uh, in terms of inflammatory foods. And then eating plenty of veggies, fruits, and herbs, um, aim for six to eight servings a day. Seeds, um, nuts, and fish are also, so that's, this is kind of a Mediterranean diet that's associated with lots of different good health outcomes, including um, reducing oxidative stress. Then we can also think about eating for blood sugar balance because imbalances in our blood sugar will promote that estrogen dominance, that gap between estrogen and progesterone. And we want to avoid that, especially if we're already leaning towards a low progesterone state. And the other thing to think about is when you're in peri and postmenopause, you're going to be less insulin resistant. And so things, you know, foods that may not have been as problematic for you before may start to be more problematic. And insulin um, is very inflammatory just in and of itself. Um, so when it's high, it's damaging, but then it also, um, you know, the more insulin resistant you get, the closer you get to diabetes and then insulin dependent diabetes. So um, how do you eat for blood sugar balance? Avoid those added sugars. Again, um, that links back to um, eating for uh, low inflammation. Um, whenever you do have a carbohydrate, even a healthy carbohydrate, like an apple or a sweet potato or oatmeal, make sure you're balancing it out with protein, fat and or fiber. So for oatmeal, you could add like full fat yogurt, um, has usually has a lot of protein to add some blueberries and some, um, chia seed, all of a sudden you're, you've got a, a meal that your body's going to break down in a much slower, more controlled way than just, just the oatmeal by itself. Um, eat phytoestrogen. So this is a little bit of a different strategy. Um, you can incorporate each of these strategies into your diet, but when you're, when you're specifically eating phytoestrogens, you're eating foods that mimic and eat and bind to estrogen receptors in our body. So when we think about hormones, we've got the hormones themselves that are secreted by a gland and traveling through the bloodstream. And then the cells have receptors, like little um, baskets reaching out for the hormones. And you need both of them and both of those pieces for proper hormone functioning, Phytoestrogens um, are chemicals in food that will bind to those estrogen receptors. And so they bind weakly, but they do have an estrogenic effect. So they can help um, provide a little bit of an estrogenic effect in the body. The best source of phytoestrogen is soy. Soy is a complicated food just because of the way we grow and process it. So I recommend um, having organic and minimally processed soy. So not like soy meat burgers, but oh, tofu or miso or tempeh or um, edamame, which is the whole soybean. Um, eat for your microbiome. Our microbiome is the, you know, the 
group of microorganisms in our, um, I'm specifically talking about our gut microbiome, um, in our, in our small and large intestine that really impact, um, so much more than just our gut health. So, um, a healthy microbiome will help uh, promote mental stamina, bone density. Um, that's because, um, it, a healthy microbiome lowers inflammation and inflammation increases the rate of bone breakdown. Um, a healthy microbiome will help with body composition, sleep, reduce inflammation, improve energy. So all of these things that become more problematic as our hormones start to bottom out, we can protect ourselves from that by supporting our microbiome. It's pretty, pretty amazing. How do you eat for your microbiome? You got to feed feed your little pets inside your intestines and they like a whole foods diet. So minimally processed with a really wide variety of plant fibers. Um, one study found that the most diversity in the microbiome, so that's good to have a diverse microbiome was associated with eating about 30 different plant types a week, which sounds like a lot, but if you make like a Thai curry or an Indian curry or food with a lot of spices and vegetables, all you can get 15 different, you know, types of plants in a meal at once. So don't be daunted by that number, but I just encourage you to um, eat a wide variety of plant foods. Just don't just get stuck on like the broccoli at dinner every night. Um, they don't, your microbiome doesn't like refined carbohydrates and neither does your blood sugar, neither um, do your ovaries. So that's a good thing just to kind of reduce, avoid artificial sweeteners and processed foods. Use antibiotics judiciously. They're an amazing tool when we need them, but they can also be overused and be detrimental to your microbiome. The other thing that's really important for hormone balancing is to make sure you're having a healthy daily bowel movement. That's something that, um, uh, I don't think we all um, are necessarily cognizant of, of, but we need to be eliminating at least once a day. Um, our co our um, liver is kind of like a wastewater treatment plant, and every day it's dumping toxins into our colon, assuming that, that those toxins are going to be removed from the body. And when they're not removed in a timely fashion, they can get reabsorbed and recirculate and cause problems. And so if you're not having a, a daily bowel movement, that's not something to just ignore. It's something to talk to a healthcare provider about. There's lots of ways we can try to make that happen. Um, so really important for our bodies to clear estrogen through our, through our stool. Okay, so exercise. How can we use exercise to help mitigate some of the effects of um that low hormone state. Well, exercise will help reduce hot flashes. It helps to mitigate um, the muscle loss and the bone density loss. Um, it helps to protect heart function and cognition as well. And it improves mood and libido. So it's super helpful for all of the changes that can come with um, menopause. But you need to change the way you exercise when you're in a low hormone state. Um, first of all, make sure you're just combining all of the beneficial exercises. So not only um, like stretching or walking, but making sure you're getting your heart rate up, making sure you're doing weight bearing, flexibility and balance. And then because we've got our estrogen is so low, we need to work harder for shorter periods of time to stimulate um, the muscles and to get the same effect um, that we would when we were younger and we got benefits from, you know, doing longer workouts, um, lifting lighter weights for more repetitions. Um, the evidence is showing we need to switch that up when we become uh, in our, you know, late peri and postmenopausal. So sprint interval training where you're running, you're doing, um, getting your heart rate up um, just for um, 15 to 60 seconds. And then you're doing, uh, you know, 30 to, to 120 seconds of a break and you repeat that. There's lots of different um, ways to do sprint interval training, but you do it for a short period of time and it confers really great benefits um, in terms of body composition and cardiovascular health when you're in that lower hormone state. And then with strength, you want to lift really heavy stuff. You don't want to just do the light, light weights, um, even not known, not just body weight, um, so you really want to work with a trainer um, who's educated in um, helping women through this phase of their life. But the recommendation really is to lift, um, you know, something that's heavy enough that you can only lift about three to five times before you need to take a break and just do multiple repetitions at that weight. So it's a, it's a different way of exercising. Um, you want to keep your core strong after menopause and, and as we start to age, um, a risk for um for death is is falls and hip fractures um so you want to want to keep your core strong you want to maintain your balance 
Um, sleep is huge and it's a, it's a catch 22 because as our hormones start to decline, it becomes harder to sleep. So really important to, to support sleep, um, reduce alcohol. That's always a low hanging fruit and, and avoid it entirely at least 30 minutes before bed. Caffeine has a half-life of six hours. So avoid it after 2 PM, eat dinner earlier. Um, ideally three, at least three hours before you go to go to bed can be really helpful for falling asleep. And then there's the sleep hygiene and the, um, avoidance of blue light, um, so that you really support your melatonin and you're not, you're not suppressing it, um, keeping your room cool and dark, like a cave. Those, that's the environment we evolved to sleep in. And then I always tell my patients, you know, when you have, if you had a toddler, if you've ever been around a toddler at bedtime, you don't just take it from what it's doing and put it in bed and expect it to sleep. You need to give it a bath and read to it and sing to it and, and get it wound down. So it's ready for bed. Um, so the same with our own bodies, you know, when we just go, 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 and then we hop into bed, it can be hard to fall asleep. Even if what we were doing before was, was fun or pleasant or exciting. Um, if it was stimulating, it can make it hard to fall asleep. So I recommend that if you are struggling with sleep, you really think about that hour before bed as an opportunity to wind down and do activities that are um, calming. It's a great time for a hot bath or restorative yoga or journaling or reading something non-stimulating. It's a really good time to have boundaries around difficult conversations around work. Um, even around, um, like I said, things that are exciting, like planning a trip or something um, can really get your cortisol up at night. So um, stress. Stress makes everything worse, of course, including perimenopause. And um, the reason that is, is, um, I'll just kind of talk you real quick through the physiology, the side of our nervous system that takes care of all our, of our automatic responses is called our autonomic nervous system. And it has two modes that aren't mutually exclusive, but they're kind of like a seesaw. And one of those modes is our stress response. And one of those modes is our relaxation response. And there's important things that happen in each of those modes, but we need to be in that relaxation response really for a lot of the, um, basic physiology in our body to go well, like hormone balancing and immune function and digestion. And when we're in a state of chronic stress, we suppress some of those processes. They don't happen um, as efficiently as they could be happening. And that can um, cause really significant problems down the road. So reduce stress where you can. And I think for women, one of the most important places to remember to reduce stress is your boundaries. Um, reducing, you know, commitments, commitments that your kids have, saying no. Um, and then the stressors you can't get rid of um, mitigate with stress reducing activities. Make sure you spend time in non-sleep rest. Sleep is important. It's not the same as non-sleep rest. Non-sleep rest is also important. And that's just your downtime. That's the time you have to fill your cup. And if you don't have that, um, you can have um, just makes everything harder. So it's important to, to give yourself that extra time. And then reframing stressors can be helpful, including the stressor of the menopausal transition. So if you reframe it as something really scary that's happening to you, to some, you know, just a normal physiological process that you have a lot of uh, power um, to um, affect, then that's it. that can help relieve that stress. Connection is huge for women. Um, the quantity and quality of interpersonal relations plays an important role for women. Um, in peri and post menopause. Women who have a social network are found to be more positive about menopause and are less likely to be depressed. More than diet, exercise, the money in your bank account, your cholesterol levels, or even your genes, it's your relationships that matter most when it comes to being happier and healthier in midlife and into old age. And um, loneliness is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease by some studies, even more of a risk factor than smoking. So nurture your relationships and your friends. Okay. So you've got those lifestyle pieces in place and you're still feeling symptoms. You still have options. Don't, don't despair. Um, uh, as one of the biggest takeaways from this is that you, you have lots of options and you can work with a provider to find the ones that are best for you. We have nutraceuticals, things like vitamin D, magnesium, um, Omega-3 are some of the ones that I, I commonly use. Um, and then botanicals and um, things like 
maca and um, black cohosh and a variety of botanicals we have to support hormones and to support the liver and to support the nervous system. So um, physical therapies, acupuncture is amazing for menopause. And then we have menopausal hormone therapy. And I don't say, I don't say hormone replacement therapy. Oftentimes you'll see it abbreviated as HRT, but for menopause, we're not actually replacing hormones, right? We're, um, that implies that we're in a state of hormone deficiency and menopause is not a state of hormone deficiency. It's a state, it's normal, just like being prepubescent is not a state of hormone deficiency. It's a normal phase of your life that just happens to be a lower hormone state. So again, the language around menopause matters. And so um, the term that's coming into favor is menopausal hormone therapy. Just like you, when you use ibuprofen, you're not replacing ibuprofen, but you're using it to treat a symptom in your body. We can use hormones in the same way. Um, these are some of the, the nutraceuticals I use um, most often. Um, we have lots of different botanicals. I'm going to run through these because we're running out of time. And I, I really want you to be up to date on the most recent recommendations for menopausal hormone therapy. Um, for women aged younger than 60 or who are within 10 years of menopause onset and have no contraindications, which would be like a personal history of breast cancer or um, clotting. The benefit risk ratio is favorable for treatments of bothersome vasomotor symptoms and prevention of bone loss. So in layman's terms, that means that um, if it's been less than 10 years since you started menopause, or if you're under the age of 60 um, and you don't have any of those reasons not to use menopausal hormone therapy, it is um, the safe to use that for the treatment, particularly of hot flashes, night sweats, and for um, bone protection. And when we talk about, you know, this applies to um, topical estrogen, oral estrogen, it doesn't apply to the um, vaginal estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is very safe and can be used um, uh, in, out, outside that window. For women who initiate hormone therapy more than 10 years from menopause onset or who are aged older than 60, that benefit risk ratio changes. And, and the reason we think that is, is because of the protective effect of estrogen on the arteries. If, if your arteries have been without estrogen for 10 years, um, they can become stiffer. And then if you give estrogen, which can promote clotting, really only when you use it orally, which I don't recommend, um, then you can be at greater risk of, um, of clotting. So there's basically a window of opportunity. You don't have to decide like the day you become postmenopausal, but you have a window of 10 years to kind of see how things go and talk with your providers and think about, and just know that if you are within that window and you fall within this group, um, for whom, um, menopausal hormone therapy is not contraindicated, then that's an option that you have. And just something to remember, I don't think I put this in the slides, but if you do choose to do menopausal hormone therapy, topical estrogen, so inter, um, a transdermal estrogen, like a patch or um, a ring or something like that is going to be safer than oral estrogen. The oral estrogen is the one that is associated with blood clots and with um, gallstones and, and gallbladder dysfunction. And uh, so um, there's really no reason to use that. And you can ask your provider for the transdermal estrogen, the patch or cream. If you have a uterus, you have to use oral progesterone to protect the uterus from growing too big. Remember, estrogen tells tissue to grow and progesterone kind of counters that. Um, when estrogen is used alone, then you do run the risk of um, endometrial cancer and you won't have a prescriber ever give you estrogen alone if you have a uterus. But what sometimes I see in the naturopathic community is that you'll get topical progesterone and um, we just don't have the studies to show that that is as protective of the uterus as the oral progesterone. Plus the oral progesterone is the one that really helps with sleep and anxiety. Um, I just switched a patient who came to me from a different provider and had been using the topical progesterone. Um, and she was really, really struggling with sleep. Um, and she, she started doing oral progesterone and started sleeping so much better. And now her uterus is, is much better protected, at least as far as the evidence we have now um, goes. So just, just all information for you to discuss with your provider. But just remember, if you have a uterus, you need to take progesterone with the estrogen as well. All right. After menopause, just a few words. Um, 
things to think about when you're going to be in that low hormone state, you're not going to have that estrogen. And there's good things about that, right? You don't have too much estrogen, but also you don't have its protective effects on your bone, your heart, your brain, and the urinary tract. So we need to think about mitigating that. Um, this is a quote from Oprah. So many women I've talked to see menopause as an ending, but I've discovered this is your moment to reinvent yourself after years of focusing on the needs of everyone else. It's your opportunity to get clear about what matters to you and then to pursue that with all of your energy, time, and talent. So I want to approach this part of the conversation, you know, with through this lens of, you know, being postmenopausal can come with a lot of freedom and can be a really exciting and fun time for women. And there are going to be, um, let's skip these up kind of the same along the same lines. Um, uh, there are some health risks that come with being postmenopausal. Um, just kind of a fun fact, menopause is relatively unique to the animal kingdom until just literally a few months ago, we thought we were the only primates who go through menopause and it was found that there was a, like a very rare tribe of chimps in Uganda that also go through menopause. Menopause is when you live uh, significantly longer than the lifespan is significantly longer than re the reproductive years. Um, uh, whales, there's a couple species of whales that have menopause and, and really that's about it. And so the question is kind of why do we have menopause? And um, one of the hypotheses is that um, having older women in the community, um, particularly grandmothers, um, helped enable their offspring to support more children and that um, helped to essentially um, uh, so support the evolution of humans to the extent that we've evolved to kind of uh, dominate the planet, potentially because of the older women in our community. So I really want to celebrate not just grandmothers, but all older women in our community who help um, help keep us all together. Um, so menopause may be an evolutionary adaptation that has contributed to our success as a human species. What... Um, happens after you after menopause you can still have some mild hormonal fluctuations but they'll eventually stabilize and then women can feel really great when that happens painful conditions that were related to higher hormone um, levels like endometriosis and fibroids can resolve um and then some symptoms do persist and those are most commonly the vaginal dryness and associated painful sex um, but remember and then of course the body composition changes um, the health risks associated with being postmenopausal, as I've referred to, a uh, higher risk of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, urinary tract infections, and cognitive disorders. All of these can be mitigated with the lifestyle factors that I um, described. And then, of course, the um, for um, the genital urinary symptoms of menopause in particular, um, vaginal estrogen can be helpful. Um, so takeaways. Remember that perimenopause is a sequence of events that can begin as early as your late 30s and early 40s. Um, lifestyle has a big impact on the experience of perimenopause. You don't have to suffer. We have lots of tools beyond lifestyle. Our health risks change after menopause, but can be mean meaningfully reduced with lifestyle. And then the postmenopausal years can be rewarding, full of purpose, and some of the best of our lives. If you want to take a deeper dive, navigating menopause um, with support, um, a provider who'll dive deep into your health history and lifestyle, use testing judiciously, help you interpret symptothermic charting, and give you personalized recommendations for lifestyle modifications, botanicals, nutraceuticals, and menopausal hormone therapy, that's a good um time to, to seek out a naturopathic physician or a functional medicine provider or another conventional provider who's done additional training in menopause. Um, the way in naturopathic medicine, we tend to approach cases is always establishing that foundation for health with those lifestyle factors and then building on that foundation with like I said, the nutraceuticals, the botanicals. So even if we do bring in the higher force intervention, like those hormones, we're making sure that the foundation of this pyramid is solid. Um, it can be helpful too, to work with someone just so you have, especially when you're making lifestyle changes. So you have that accountability support and validation for all your hard work. So if you would like to schedule with myself or the other naturopath at Ripple, here's some contact information. You'll get these slides after the presentation. And I, um, yeah, be sure to drop your email in the chat if you want to stay connected. And thank you for coming. What questions do people have?
Let's see if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask it. I have a quick question. I've just recently been diagnosed as being in perimenopause and I feel like I have both symptoms of high and low estrogen. So I have night sweats, but I also have a lot of the other things on the other side. So what is that about? Yeah, that can be, maybe you do have high and low estrogen. So, and also remember the low progesterone can cause night sweats too. So um, it depends on, on your age and how close you are to that final menstrual period. But if we think about that, that graph that I showed you um, earlier in the presentation, there is a phase where you can have that kind of wildly fluctuating estrogen and, and then experience um uh, symptoms of both low and high estrogen. If, if the only symptom of low estrogen that you feel like you're really experiencing is the hot flashes and night switch, sometimes that can be associated with low progesterone. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question? What about, uh, perimenopause when you progesterone makes you go cuckoo nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so the high, high progesterone or supplementing with progesterone, what, what supplement? What? Yeah. If they if you're give you progesterone it? and it just really uh, makes you agitated. So, and yeah, it can depend <laughs> on the form of progesterone. So um, progesterone, if you're only using progesterone and not estrogen, then you do have flexibility to use that estrogen, that progesterone topically or transdermally or intravaginally um, in the form, you know, an, an IUD or an IUD is, is um, a progestin that is going to be similar to progesterone, at least in the uterus. So there's different ways um, to use progesterone. And sometimes um, my, the most, the things I see most commonly, especially with oral progesterone is, um, emotional kind of mood swings, weepiness, um, bloating, constipation, feeling puffy. So, so women don't always feel great. Um, and that's when you can talk to your provider about, um, dosing options. Um, if you're not on estrogen, if you are, there is a minimum amount of progesterone that is shown to be protective of the uterus and that, that is going to be, um, limiting. And that's where, um, naturopathic medicine or botanical medicine can be helpful because there, we have those botanicals that can kind of serve as an in-between depending on what's going on with you. And we can try um, different botanicals instead of the estrogen to see if we can help relieve those low estrogen symptoms without having to need the progesterone. Um, I have seen women just feel better on lower progesterone or on um, uh, switching to a bioidentical progesterone versus a, a progesterone. Yeah, all forms at are agitating. All forms are agitating. All forms. Yeah. And um that's where um yeah I think working with nutraceuticals um again if you're taking estrogen you have to have the oral progesterone but if you're not right. then you have a lot of flexibility with botanicals and nutraceuticals that can and lifestyle that can help achieve mm -hmm. similar effects. Um and without the agitation from, from progesterone. So I would say if you're not tolerating the hormone, then think about, um, think about botanicals as an option and think about lifestyle and how can you, how can you mitigate that low hormone right. state of replacing it? Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What else? See if there's anything in the chat. Uh, so I have a question. Um, you mentioned that shorter periods are normal. What about really long periods? So shorter, um, when you say periods, you're just talking about the, the days of bleeding, right? Yes, and yeah. Shorter periods can happen. And yeah, longer periods can happen too. If you, if you think about if you've built up that endometrium um, without the presence of progesterone and maybe, so maybe you've built it up for longer and there's more tissue, it can just take more time for that tissue to, to exit the body. And so you can have longer, longer periods. Now you want to be careful of, of, um, losing too much blood, particularly iron. If you're, if you're bleeding really heavily, especially, you know, changing a, a super pad or, or super tampon more than every two hours, that's something to share with a provider and, um, and check into iron deficiency and, uh, and to try to, um, 
mitigate if that's happening on a regular basis, you, you definitely want to do something about it. And there are things that you can do. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion? Um, I have estrogen positive breast cancer and mm -hmm. um, I have um, several um, doctors who want me to use the estrogen vaginally for dryness and other things. Mm -hmm. um, what's your feeling about adding estrogen when I have the estrogen positive breast cancer? Uh, my training is that that is safe, that the topical, the vaginal estrogen, it doesn't circulate systemically. It really only acts on those tissues, but it would be, I would always run that by your oncologist first before you okay. add on any form of hormone. But yeah, that's been my training as well, that that's okay. But we do have other options. If it makes you uncomfortable, if you just don't, if you want to steer clear of estrogen, um, there's vaginal moisturizers like hyaluronic acid, um, vitamin E that we can use as a suppository or topically. So, um, you don't have to use estrogen, um, okay. but it can be, it can be, it is safe. That, and and the, the estrogen that's used in the, um, vaginal is estriol. It's our weakest form of estrogen. So it, it has been shown to be safe. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What else? Hey, Kelly. Um, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So um, I treat pelvic floor. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. And I often okay. get asked by women. Hi. Hey, I, I, I was, my face is not on there. Just my picture. But I often, it's because my hair looks messy, but um, it's, I often get asked and I typically tell women to start it three times a week, but when you're using vaginal um, estrogen, you know, to plump up the tissue and to make it more comfortable, what do you normally start people off three times a week daily? What is your usually recommendation? So when you're, when you're starting the vaginal estrogen for um, genital urinary symptoms of menopause, or is that what was your question? Yeah, just dryness, lack of lubrication, um, tissue thinning. Um, you know, even women that I see who have like lichen sclerosis, uh, they mm -hmm. they need it because the tissue is really uncomfortable. But um, how do you do you provide recommendations on how often they should use topical estrogen, or do you kind of leave that more to like the gynecologist, or how do you get involved with that? Yeah, I've mostly used it just for vaginal dryness and I often use it um, like as a suppository. Um, and when I do that, I will use it on a nightly basis for two weeks and then I'll start spreading it out. Uh, when I um, recommend it topically I, I, as a, um, a gel or cream, I just have, um, have women use it daily for mild vaginal dryness, but I haven't used it for lichen sclerosis or things like that. That's something I've left to gynecologists in the past. So yeah, what, what's your, um, you said you, you like to start out, uh, spreading out the dose and then gradually building up. Yeah, that's typically because people are, um, <laughs> there is a lot of times with the women that I see, they just aren't doing it often enough to begin with. So it's oh. like, Oh, I did it like once. And then I forgot to do it. So I was like, okay. okay, well, let's just start like every other day just to get on yeah. a program with that and just see how it feels. And usually yeah. they really like it. Um, uh, but to just piggyback on your recommendation for vitamin E suppository for lubrication, mm -hmm. I tell women to get the gel capsules that you can buy empty and then buy vitamin E, put it in there and you can insert it. It's so cheap and it's great yeah. for lubrication. So yeah. that was, that's such a good recommendation. I love it. That's great. Thank, thank you. Appreciate it. What else? All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and thanks for all your, um, oh, so I just, I did see one question. Does the Marin IUD provide enough progesterone, progesterone when using estradiol patches? Yes not just the oral that Marin IUD can, can also counter the estradiol patches as well. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you all so much for coming. I'll hand back to Vanessa. Thank you all so much. And I hope everyone has a great evening. I'll be sending out the slides and the recording tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Thanks so much.